Yes, it is. It's, uh, I think people knew that already, but I think ours is one of the first actual empirical studies that, that try to estimate that sensitivity. Um, probably because um, the economists haven't been brought into this field too much yet, and I think it's just starting to, to bring the social sciences in to, in to look at the weather, weather impacts. The work that has been done before has kind of been back of the envelope. There have been studies about individual cases like agriculture or grapes or things like that, but not looking at the whole U.S. economy before. It's, it's basically the data. Um, it takes a lot of data, um, and it took us probably a year just to bring all the data together. So we, we did this at the state level and the 11 sectors within the state. So for every sector, for every state over about a 30-year period, we needed data on capital, labor, energy, weather, output. So it took a long time to bring that data together in a way that we, we could analyze the data and try to tease out that sensitivity. I think any economist could have done this. It's, it's not, I hate to say this, it's not rocket science. Um, it's using some fairly um, standard um, analytical methods from, from economics. What, what we had, or possibly had, we, we knew enough of the weather people and had access to them to know where to ask for the weather data. Um, so getting the weather data from the NCDC, anybody can do that, but being aware that that's where you can get that would have taken a little bit more kind of initiative from somebody outside of the, outside of the field. Um, a couple things, the, the atmospheric science community has, has a ton of data and actually has much, much more data than economists. It's, you know, you're talking hourly observations over small grids. In economics, you're talking very, um, I guess, our, our grids are larger. You're talking county, maybe states for data. Our time periods are maybe once a year, maybe once every census we get data. So matching up those data. In terms of working with the weather people, I, I found across the whole industry, weather people are absolutely passionate about what they do. They're, they're excited about weather, um, and I, I'm not, I don't see that in economics. People are passionate about their analysis, but people don't get up and jump down and say, oh, the GDP went up 1.2%, but the temperature changes and people get excited. So definitely a lot of passion. Um, and pretty much anything you say is, is taken to heart and people are, are seeking information that we can bring to this. So people want to know what, what the impacts are. And I think a lot of the weather community really is passionate about the impacts on society. And there's, there's passion about the weather, but they're really also passionate about, about how what the weather forecasting affects society. And ultimately saving lives and property is for, for a lot of people their ultimate goal here. Well, don't turn them away too quickly. It's, it's interdisciplinary work and not just economics. It's a difficult thing. We're talking different languages quite often. And actually, economics probably works better with, um, say, uh, meteorology than a lot of other social scientists because economics is very much um, data-driven. We do a lot of modeling. We do a lot of statistical analysis. So it's, it's a realm that we have um, something in common, um, whereas a lot of other social sciences are more qualitative, bring very good um, science. But the, the way of thinking about science and the way of thinking about analysis may be different. Even though I'm finding a lot of um, meteorology people very data-driven, but they use different methods. So there's, there's languages that have to be spoken across the divide. And that's, that's been for seven years in, the, in our program, trying to understand how to talk across the divide between disciplines. It's, it's been challenging, but it's also been, it's, it's the neat part, it's the fun part, it's the exciting part. Not too much. I, I think you know everybody knows that the weather sensitive. There's been previous work, subjective work, that said it was it was you know a third of the U.S. economy, something like that. We wanted to boil this down and say what what did the numbers tell us? In our approach, we we came up um, so over a 70 year period, which is the the the, the data we did for our analysis, um, kind of our our Monte Carlo or simulation, said it may vary by about three or four percent, which is um, it doesn't sound much. Like but when you think of a you know eleven fifty or what were fifteen trillion dollar economy, that's a lot. You know, that's a big impact. So if if we we're talking um, you know four hundred, five hundred, six hundred billion dollars swings in the in the U.S. productivity, 
that can be attributed to weather, that's something we really need to start looking at more and really dig in to say, um, is, that, is, is our analysis right? Are we doing this right? Because this is just the first study. I always think it takes multiple studies. But that's a lot of potential for, for savings, for risk, avert, or risk um, um, mitigation, um, to, to do better for the economy. And we're not talking about saving lives on this point, but for you know, $600 billion of the U.S. economy that, that perhaps we can do better to reduce that impact. I think we have it in our data to start to look at that. We'd, uh, we'd like to do another study and, and bring in more data. Um, we'd like to look at the impact of severe weather. And, and you're right, things like, we did find agriculture was highly sensitive to weather, and everybody knows that, you know, you know 15% of agriculture versus maybe 2 or 3% of retail. But the difference there is, is agriculture is a very small part of the U.S. economy now, whereas retail or services is maybe, a, you know, so services is something like 30% of the economy, so it's a much bigger absolute impact, but a relatively small impact. In agriculture, there's a lot of effort in agriculture to, to mitigate um, weather impacts, but it's only um, something like 3-4% of the U.S. economy at this point. Um, one thing we, we try to explain in the paper in our work is, is when you aggregate this over time, so if you have a really bad snowstorm, say, two weeks before Christmas, and nobody goes shopping that day, and, and the retailer is saying, oh, this is the worst, you know, two weeks before Christmas. Well, people go out the, week, the next week when the weather's better. So to some extent, this washes out over time. So it's not that the impact isn't there, but people change behavior. They, they respond to weather. They respond to changes, even in climate, and they mitigate that in it so that the absolute the end impact when you aggregate over a year isn't as small as maybe the day-to-day -day impact of weather. And that's something we, we're trying to, to get across is, even though you know, a third of the economy is uh, susceptible to weather, when we shift and we change our behavior and respond to weather, the economic impact may not be quite as large. On the other hand, there's maybe some sectors in agriculture be one, if you get a killing frost, you can't grow the, the fruit next week. It's, it's, it is more of a permanent impact. But something like retail can shift, shift behavior quite easily. That's, um, that's something we weren't able to, we can't get at our data because embedded in the way the economy works is the current knowledge about weather, weather forecasting, uh, mitigation of weather impacts. So given that the data that we have is result of what's already in the system, we can't um, use our data to back out say, what if you took meteorology away? What if you took forecasting away? That, that's a different type of analysis that we can't get with actually the historical data. Um, I think it'd be perfectly valid to say that, yeah, the sensitivity would be greater, but that's part of what happens over time with economies and technology is that we, we adapt to that, we build that into our systems. We, we have things like insulation in our buildings. We have um, more insulation up north than in, than in the south. We have air conditioning. So we've adapted to a lot of that. The question is, if, if things change, how much is the cost of adapting to changes? Or if the variability, if we have more variability, are our current technologies and our current capital stock built to, to deal with that variability? Well, and it's the, the $100 billion impact from Katrina, um, it, it, that's the damages, that may be the insurance cost. And unfortunately, the flip side is that, in some cases, that may actually help the economy. It may, you may have $100 billion of new building, new construction. The difference there, that may be economic activity, but that doesn't improve the welfare of the people. So it's kind of, economists talk about you could, you could have jobs programs where you have one crew digs holes, one crew fills those holes in. It's actually economic activity, but it doesn't make anybody better off. So that $100, $100 billion impact is huge, and our, and our data actually did not cover that event um, at this point. But it's, it's, it's also something that may wash out in the big picture when you spread, say, what the consumption in, in Louisiana may be moved elsewhere. So um, maybe people, instead of vacationing New Orleans, went to Hawaii that year. So unfortunately, it's a big impact socially, but economically, it may not be quite as, as bad. It's really economic activity. It's, it's how much we've produced in the economy. Um, but if you think about it, your, your happiness and your welfare isn't necessarily tied directly to how much you consume. So 
Um, you, you can be better off or worse off with more or less economic activity, but they're not exactly the same thing. Well, that's a whole other ball of wax. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's some of the work we do on, say, the benefits of, of hurricane forecasting. That you may actually, um, economically, you may only pay $5 a year to, to the government for what you get for weather forecasting. But the benefit, the welfare benefit, you get maybe hundreds of dollars. So and we, this is an area we call non-market valuation, where you try to get an estimate of the welfare effects, but not necessarily what you're, what you're putting down on the table. And so we have studies that say people may be willing to pay, um, say, three, four hundred dollars a year for the forecast they get from the weather service because that's the benefit to them. But they're only paying five dollars, and that's actually that's a role of the government sector is to provide these public goods um, that can't be that aren't generally provided by the private sector. So that that's a whole other whole other type of study. <laughs> And that, that's actually where the economic data, we start getting constrained because we don't have good day-to-day -day economic data. There, there's not satellites up there watching people spend their money. Day well, maybe there is, but uh, we, we, don't, we don't have data on people spending an income day-to-day -day the way that we do on weather. So we, we haven't been able to, to boil this down to that type of scale. So we, we're, we're aggregating this over, over the year. We may be able to get this down to quarterly data uh, but again, there's a lot of limitations on the economic side of the data that's available to look at this.